This is lesson 7.4, solving polynomial equations in factored form. You should be on page 378. In this lesson, you will learn how to use the zero product property, how to factor polynomials using the greatest common factor, and how to use the zero product property to solve real life problems. So, let's review the zero product property. We learned this back in the introduction chapter. A polynomial is in factored form when it is written as a product of factors. So the key word here is product, multiply. So if you look at, for example, here, this is in standard form. But if I wrote it like this, that's factored form. Now I want you to notice something. If you're like, well, those aren't the same thing, yes, they are. If you take x and distribute it through, look what happens. You get x times x is x squared, x times 2 is 2x. These are the exact same statements. Maybe I should color code them in green. These are the same statements. It's just that's in standard form and that's in factored form. Same thing here. I'll use my pink pen. That statement is in standard form. This is the exact same statement. It's just in factored form. Again, if you don't believe me, look, x times x is x squared, and x times 8 is 8x, and negative 3 times x is negative 3x, and negative 3 times 8 is negative 24. And if you combine these together, you get x squared plus 5x minus 24, which is exactly what the statement was to start. So factored form is when you take standard form and you write it out as a multiplication of two factors. You can see we're multiplying here, multiplying here. Now, why is that important? This goes back to the introduction chapter, and here's the zero product property. When one side of an equation is a polynomial in factored form, that means we have a multiplication, and the other side is zero, we can use the zero pro product property to solve the polynomial equation. So let's look at the zero product property and review it. If the product of two numbers is zero, then at least one of the numbers is zero. So in algebra, that means if I'm taking A times B and I'm getting an answer of zero, that means either A must equal zero or B must equal zero. One of those two have to be true. A or B have to be zero. Now, the solutions to these equations are called roots, okay? They're, they're solutions, but they're also called roots. So when you hear the word roots, that also means it's a solution of the uh, equation when something equals zero, okay? So let's look at this, let's look at using this property in this situation now. We're going to solve these polynomial equations. So look carefully here. I'm going to color code again. I think that helps see things. We are taking 2x, and we're multiplying 2x by x minus 4. Now, do you notice when you multiply these things, you're getting 0 for an answer. That means either 2x or x minus 4 has to be 0. Well, let's solve each. To make 2x 0, if I divide by 2, x would equal 0. Or to solve x minus 4, if I add 4 to each side, I'd find out x equals 4. Those are the roots of this equation, 0 and 4. Okay, let's look over here. Second problem. Okay, I'm taking x minus 3, and I'm multiplying it with x minus 9, and I'm getting 0 for an answer. So if I'm multiplying and getting 0 for an answer, either my statement in blue or my statement in green, one of those two have to equal 0. Okay, so let's see that. So... Um, x minus 3 could equal 0, or x minus 9 could equal 0. Well, if I add 3 here, that means x would equal 3, or if I add 9 here, x would equal 9. So if I plug a 3 in for x or a 9 in for x, that would make the statement equal to 0. So those are called the roots of my equation. I'm just using the fact that when I multiply, if my answer is zero, one of those statements must work out to zero. 
What I'd like you to do is pause the video and you try these three. Find the roots of these factored form equations. And I'm back, and here are the solutions to 1, 2, and 3. If you aren't getting those, make sure you raise your hand and ask in class, and we can go through in more detail why these are the solutions. Now, when you solve factor form equations, you're going to get roots. You hear that plural? When two or more roots of an equation are the same number, the equation has repeated roots. So it is possible. Now, none of, the pr none of these examples that we did on the previous page had repeated roots, but it is possible to get repeated roots, okay? Let's look at these samples. I'm taking 2x minus 7 and multiplying it by 2x, I'm sorry, 2x plus 7, I meant to say. I'm multiplying it with 2x minus 7, and that equals 0. That means one of these statements has to equal 0. Well, let's solve each. Here I can take away 7 first, which would give me 2x equals negative 7, and then divide by 2, I'd get negative 7 halves. Here I'm adding 7 first, which would give me 2x equals 7, and then divide by 2, and I get 7 halves. So this does not have repeated roots. I have two separate roots. x could equal negative 7 halves, or x could equal 7 halves. Now if you look at this question, I'm taking x minus 1 and squaring it, and that equals 0. So I'm taking x minus 1 times x minus 1 equals 0. So, same thing. That could work out to 0 or that. Well, to make x minus 1 work out to 0, x would be 1. To make x minus 1 work out to 0 here, x would be, be 1. So you notice I'm getting the same answer twice. That's called a repeated root. I'm getting 1 either way as an answer. It is possible that you could be multiplying with more than just uh, two factors. Like here, I have one factor, two factors, and three factors, okay? So if I make x plus 1 equal to 0, I take away 1 from each side, x would be negative 1. If x minus 3 equals 0, if I add 3 to each side, x equals 3. And if x minus 2 equals 0, if I add 2 to each side, x equals 2. Do you notice I'm getting three separate roots for this problem? If I plug in a negative 1, a 3, or a 2, I'm going get, to get this statement to work out to 0, okay? Let's have you try 4, 5, and 6. Find the roots of these three equations. Okay, I'm back. Uh, the answers to these are right up here, 4, 5, and 6. Again, if you aren't getting those, make sure when you come to class that you pause or raise your hand and say, hey, can we talk about those? We can do those on the board. Make sure you're understanding why those are correct. Let's talk about how we factor polynomials using the greatest common factor. Now, to solve a polynomial equation using the zero pro product property, you need factored form polynomials. Now, sometimes they're not factored for you. You might have to factor it yourself or write it as a product of other polynomials. So they're not always going to come nice like you see in these previous questions where I'm pointing at the top of the screen where it's just automatically factored for you. You might have to factor it yourself. Now, to do that, you look for the greatest common factor. This is the monomial that divides evenly into each term. So we're looking for the largest amount that would divide into all the terms. I think it's easiest to show the greatest common factor in a sample. So here they're having us find the greatest monomial factor. So look at this polynomial here. I'm going to circle it. 4x to the 4th plus 24x cubed. So let's look at the numbers first, 4 and 24. I'm asking myself, what's the biggest number that goes into 4 and 24? Well, 4 would divide into 4, and 4 certainly divides into 24. So the greatest common factor of 4 and 24 is 4. Now concentrate on the variables. You have x to the 4th and x to the 3rd. Okay? x to the 4, think about it, means x times x times x times x, and x to the 3rd means x times x times x. You notice I can definitely factor 3, 
factors of x from each. So that's why they're saying the greatest common factor of these is x to the third. I can definitely take out three factors of each. So the greatest common factor of this is 4x cubed. There's my 4 and there's my x cubed. So if I factor a 4x cubed out of the statement, if I take the 4x cubed and I factor it out, I'd be left with x for my first monomial. And if I factor out 4x cubed here, I'd be left with 6. So if you're like, where are you getting that from? Think. If you multiply these back together, you get right to here, 4x to the 4th. And if you multiply 4x cubed and 6 together, you get right back there. Okay? So, the, so when I factor out 4x to the 3rd power, I get this multiplication, 4x cubed times x plus 6. Let's have you try to factor out the greatest monomial factor from 8y squared minus 24y. So pause the video and do that. When you factor out the greatest common monomial factor, you should be factoring out an 8y and be left with y minus 3. So 8y times y minus 3 would give you the same thing as 8y squared minus 24y. Now, if you're like, I don't get that, again, this would be something, raise your hand in class, we can walk through that again. So now we can use factoring to solve equations that are not already factored for us. Now, when you do this, I have a little note, you always want to make sure all terms are on one side and zeros on the other side before you look for the greatest common monomial factor. So when you look at sample A, we have 2x squared plus 8x equals 0. Now, do you notice there's no multiplication here? We're adding. So what's the greatest monomial factor? Well, let me color code. Um, for the numbers, what can I divide 2 and 8 by? I could divide them both by 2. And when I divide by 2, I'm left with a 1 here and a 4 there, right? And now my variables, let me highlight those separately. I have x squared and x. I can definitely factor out one factor of x from both, which would me leave me with one factor here. And I already took the factor from there. So I get 2x times x plus 4 would equal 0, which is what they have. So you notice I'm multiplying. I'm multiplying this times that and getting 0, which means one of these have to equal 0. So either 2x equals 0 or x plus 4 equals 0. If I divide each side by 2, I get x equals 0. And if I take away 4 from each side here, I get x is negative 4. There are my roots. Okay? This helps me with this one. I have to get everything on one side, 0 on the other first. So the first step would be to take away 15n from each side which they did here. So let me write that out so I can kind of draw on this. Now the next thing, this isn't, this isn't a product, it's a subtraction. I want a product so I can use the zero product property. So it's time for me to factor the greatest common monomial factor. So I have a 6 and a 15. What's the biggest number that would go into 6 and 15? And I'm thinking 3 does. 6 divided by 3 is 2 and 15 divided by 3 is 5. So Let's factor out the 3. I have a 2 here, and I have a 5 there. Okay, now variable. Let's get the variables now. Um, I have an n squared and an n. I have two factors of n and one factor of n. I can definitely pull one factor of n from both, which leaves me with one factor here. Okay, there's my statement, just like you see there. Now, next, I can use the zero product property. 3n times 2n minus 5 has to equal 0. That means 3n would equal 0 or 2n minus 5 would equal 0. Okay, let's solve. If I divide by 3 here, n is 0. Let's solve 2n minus 5 equals 0 next. If I add 5, I get 2n equals 5, and I can divide by 2 n would equal 5 halves, which is matching what they have here. So here are my answers. n could equal 0 or n could equal 5 halves.
why don't you pause the video and you quickly try numbers 8, let's do 8 and 10, okay, 8 and 10, I want you to solve each of these. You're going to have to factor first because neither one of these are factored for you. And I'm back. For number 8, you should have gotten 0 and negative 5 for your solutions. And number 10, you should have gotten 0 and half for your solutions. 0 and half. Okay? And then let's finish up. You can use this to solve real life problems as well. Um, you can model the arch of a fireplace using the equation y equals negative one ninth x plus 18 times x minus 18 where x and y are measured in inches. And you can see the picture of the fireplace here. x is on the horizontal axis, y in the vertical. The x-axis, that's here, represents the floor. Find the width of the arch at the floor level. So to find the width, it would be nice if we could find out what, you know, this is where y is 0 here, it's an unknown value for x, y is 0, unknown value for x, y is 0. So let's plug in 0 for y. I need y to equal 0. So if we plug 0 into this equation, you can now use the 0 product property. Negative 1 ninth times this times this is 0, which means x plus 18 has to be equal to 0, or x minus 18 has to equal 0. Well, if x plus 18 equals 0, that means x would be negative 18. And if x minus 18 equals 0, x would be 18. Now, we've got to be careful. It's easy to say, well, there's my answer. I'm done. We haven't answered the question yet. We want to find the width of the arch at floor level. So this point is the point 18, 0. And this point is the point negative 18, 0, which means from here to here is 18, and from here to here is a width of 18. 18 and 18, that means the width of this fireplace must have been 36 inches. I'm going to pause the video or stop the video here. If you have questions, make sure you ask in class.